by going back to Godhead. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Who wants to read? You want to read, Yamuna? Go ahead. Let's read out loud. Uh, wait a minute. So you see what happens if you engage in devotional service, then the ocean of material suffering becomes reduced to the size of water in the footprint of a calf, which not which it becomes uh, basically uh, not significant at all. Whereas for most people, it's an ocean. They can't, they just drown in it. Go ahead. The place where there are no material miseries. Where is that place? There's danger in every step of life. The material world. Do you believe that? That there's danger in every step? Yeah, it's an extremely dangerous place. Just just like uh, just this week, a Prabhupada disciple was driving his motorbike back from a kirtan program in Alachua, and he got run over by a Mack truck. Completely crushed, dead. And a very good devotee. His name is uh, Kalyapani Das. He's dead. Right outside the house of a devotee, actually. When they heard the, the noise, they ran out of the house, and uh, the, the devotee that was living in that house with his family, he pulled the body out of the of the dead motorcycle driver, and he saw it's it's a devotee, crushed completely. It happened in a matter of a few seconds. So there's there's danger. Yet it says, "Padam padam yat vipadam natisam." There's danger in every step in this world. Okay, go ahead. of the Lord. Consequently, he becomes qualified to enter into the Vaikuntha planets where there is neither material miserable, material, miserable life nor the influence of time and death. To, to know one's constitutional position means to know also the sublime position of the Lord. Okay, so where are the three steps of self-realization? Can you say that? Uh, first, you have to uh, know that you're the soul, not the body. Yes. And then you have to 
know that Krishna is the super soul and that he is the um, maintainer. Wait, wait, that he is. Okay. Well, then you have to understand the difference between the jiva soul oh, and yeah, the super soul. Oh, yeah, the jiva soul. soul and the super soul, yeah. Right? And then First, you understand the difference between the jiva and the body. Yeah. Then you understand the difference between the jiva and the super soul, soul or paramatma, right? Yeah. Or the atma and paramatma, right? Yeah. And then next? And then you engage in, oh, then you understand your consti constitutional position, and then you engage in, engage in his service, Krishna's service, okay? Well, then you, then the next, the third step is to understand that the material world, all the jivas, all the incarnations and the super soul, they all come from Krishna. That everything comes from Krishna. Then, because you also come from Krishna, and your body, your material body, is made of Krishna's material energy that also comes from Krishna. And Krishna is also present in your heart and he's also present in every atom of the universe. And he is the origin of everything. Then what's the, con what's the conclusion that you have after all that knowledge? That you should serve him. Exactly right. You belong to him. Everything belongs to him, therefore. You should serve him. And if you don't have that knowledge, out of ignorance, you think, oh, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make this material world perfect, and I'll find a way to make my, my, my material body eternal, and I'll earn a lot of money, and I'll freeze myself before I die, so that they can unfreeze me in the future. And heal my body so I can live in my body and enjoy more sense gratification. What happens if you get frozen? You die. You die immediately. <laughs> they find animals and human beings are frozen completely in Siberia before they die, right? And then they thaw them out. Do they come back alive? No. No. Not at all. They're dead. So, and people make all these silly attempts to make the body immortal, the material body, because they have no knowledge of the soul. They, they haven't gotten past the first step of self-realization to understand the difference between the soul and the body. That's the first step. What are the other two, uh, Augustine? Yes. And third, understand, understand ice cream. That it, no, okay. What's the third? Okay, you got one and two right. What's the third? Come on, think, think. Don't stink, think. Understand that the material nature, the jiva, the super soul, comes from Krishna. They're not created because they're eternal. They all come from Krishna. They're all, they're all part and parcel of Krishna. And then what's the conclusion? That everything comes from Krishna, matter, soul, super soul, incarnations, everything. So what's the conclusion when you know all that? Yeah, you should serve Krishna. All right, good. Okay, go ahead. Give back the mic. One who wrongly thinks that the living entity's position and the Lord's position are on the same level is to be understood as uh, is to be understood to be in darkness and therefore unable to engage himself in the devotional service of the Lord. 
he becomes a lord himself and thus he becomes a lord himself and thus paves the way for the repetition of birth and death but one who understands that his position is to serve transfers himself to the service of the lord at once becomes eligible for vaikuntha loka service for the cause of the Lord is called karma yoga or buddhi yoga in the pl plain or in plain words devotional service to the Lord very good so because of ignorance people suffer where and, and what is the ignorance they don't know the difference between the body and the soul Therefore, they just work to decorate the body and they ignore the soul. That's called ignorance. And as long as people do that, they just increase their suffering. It doesn't go away, it gets worse. And there's a very nice verse in Bhagavad Gita, in the sixth chapter, it says, Uh, let me see where it says that. It doesn't say uh. It says. Maybe it's the fifth chapter. Uh, anyway, it says that someone who knows the transcendental nature of Krishna, who's in his heart as, as Paramatma, he becomes just as free as Krishna. So this knowledge of Krishna liberates a person. You become free. What does everybody want in life? They want freedom from birth, death, old age, and disease. And it's, ra it's rather easy, if you, if you think about it, that simply by becoming uh, a sincere devotee of Krishna and engaging in his service, you become free. Free of the laws of karma, free of the miseries of old age, disease, and death, and so forth. So, therefore, what should be our main purpose in life? Sanskriti. What should be our main purpose in life? Huh? Huh? Well, before you serve him, you have to know Krishna. Know about Krishna, right? <coughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't serve him. Like, for example, if you know nothing about, uh, let's say, you know nothing about chanting Hare Krishna, would you chant Hare Krishna? Are you? Huh? What? No, you would not chant because you know nothing about it. So, therefore, before you. You want to serve Krishna, you have to know about him. Is that what we're doing now? We're learning about Krishna so that, 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 so that Krishna becomes the goal of our life, to know him. Okay, I'm not finding this verse, so we won't. I'll look for it later on. All right, so now let's go to the lecture. Mayapur, did you find a lecture? Okay. So who's going to begin reading? Okay. You have the microphone? I thought there were two microphones. Okay. No, she has it. Go ahead. Now, last, in our last meeting, oh, was the last meeting the one we read before? Previous verse, oh, okay. 50. 
we were discussing this verse that karma gyan, uh, karma gyan, um, every action every activities that we are engaged in is has, is, got. has got a reaction any action it has got it uh, every action it has got reaction and that reaction is another bondage for me now I am engaged in one action and I am producing, produ uh, producing another reaction. Now in the present moment I am bounding my, by one kind of activities and I am producing another kind of activities. Just like in the cinematographic school, there that's, are... That's, wait, that that means, you know, you have a uh, a movie, but how is the movie made? It's a series of uh, photographs, and each one is a little different than the other. So when you uh, project it in the projector, you see a, the, oh, this succession of of pictures. It looks like it's moving. There's a little, you know, it, it shows a person walking. Well. Uh, there are about, let's say, 15 frames showing the person walking or running. Each one is slightly different than the other. When you put it all together quickly, it looks like someone running. This is the way they made movie films before. Now it's, uh, it might be a little different, but that, that was the old time way that they made films. It, it, it was, a film was a series of, you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of pictures and each one was a little bit different than the other when you sh when you show it in succession like this quickly it looks like people are walking talking and so forth and they and they sync up the their voice with their movements you see, and you, you see their mouth moving you see their head moving you see them walking you see them running you see them jumping but actually if you look at the film each one is a static picture each one is uh, each uh, part of each uh, photo is a photograph, but when you put it together quickly, it, it comes. It seems to come alive, and there's someone that's walking, running, and so forth. That's a photographic. What term is he using here? A photographic well, spool. spool. Oh, cinematic, <laughs> cinematic spool. A spool. Cinematographic. Cinem Spool. A spool is that whole uh, tape of the film with all those different pictures. That's called the spool. Okay, go ahead. There are hundreds and thousands of pictures. One picture, pa one picture passes, another picture present, and another picture is ahead. The whole picture, when put into the machine, it represents some activity. So we are bound up by nature's law in such a way. Why nature's law? Even in your state laws, we are bound up by so many laws. So this, pos this is our position. This is called conditioned stage of life. There is no freedom. The so-called freedom, we declare that I belong to the free nation. I am free. These are simply mental speculation. Okay, now wait no a minute. Would you, let, let's say you, you, you were in school and you ask like 10 kids, do you think you're free? What do you think they would answer? Yes. Yes, they would all say yes. What if you asked their parents, do you think you're free? What do they say? They would most probably say yes. Maybe a few would say, no, I'm not free, it's because of Trump. You know, but you know, that, in other words, if, if Obama was still president, they would be free, but that, that's nonsense. So. This is, a, this is an important point to understand. Nobody is free. No one, we're all acting under the influence of ignorance. And we're getting more and more bound up by the laws of karma. And we're getting old, we're getting sick, we're dying, there's accidents happening. And we're bound up by a previous karma, we're bound up by the laws of nature, the modes of material nature, and our own ignorance. So, this is a hard point for people to understand. But it's a fact that no one is actually free. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Yes. One thing, Prophet, sir. Give him that microphone. I belong to the free nation. America is free nation. Yeah. <laughs> free and brave. But this seems, Prophet, this seems to be going against that. Yeah, you have to turn it on. The button, you just press it, it becomes green light. It's on. Yes. So here Prophet is saying, people declare that I belong to a free nation. Mm. They say America, the free, the free world. Yes. Is that true? Nobody's free. Hmm? So, I'm asking, America, is it the land of the free? No. Not really. No. Yeah, Prabhupada is, it's 1966 and Prabhupada is, is dismissing that. There is no freedom, he says. The so-called freedom, we declare that I belong to the free nation. I am free. These are all simply mental speculation. There is no freedom. How can you be free if you're subject to birth, death, old age, and disease? And you have karma that you don't even know what it is until it happens. Yeah. The body itself doesn't want to be free. Like, yeah. Uh, like, if, we want, if we don't want to eat, but we are still forced to eat because we are hungry. Yeah. You don't want to pass stool, but you're still forced to pass stool. Yeah. Right. I knew this one man. Uh, he was from Africa. And he would only eat raw grains. He would soak them in water after, for a day, and then he would eat them. Right. And he told me, that he never passes urine in stool. He told me. Now, I let him live in the temple, not in, inside the temple building, but he had a, a van. He and his wife, they lived in the van. And they both, you know, did that. You know, they, they both only ate raw grains that were soaked in water over, overnight. And they would chew it very slowly. They would chew it very slowly so that they would basically digest it in their saliva in their mouth and then they would swallow it and they would not eat a lot and they would drink very little water right and he kept insisting that you don't pass stool or urine <laughs> so and then his wife became pregnant and he kept telling me she's going to give birth uh, you know in the v in the VW van I said well I said maybe I said, maybe you should, uh, he said, no, 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 I know what I'm doing. I said, oh, I said, okay. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't argue, huh? What is Volkswagen? Volkswagen van, yeah. They had this, this van, they lived in a van in, in, the, in the parking lot of the temple, right? And they never ate any prasadam. And it looked like they never passed stool or urine, you know, they didn't come into the bathroom at all, right? So now he's telling me his wife is going to give birth naturally in the van. So the day came when his wife was supposed to give birth, right? And some complication happened, right? And she was in great pain and anxiety, and he called the ambulance. <laughs> Here's a guy who didn't believe in you know, ambulances and hospitals. He was a fanatic, right? Called, called the ambulance. They had to rush over. They rushed her to the hospital and saved her life. Right? And what happened after that? Soon after that, he got a job, got an apartment, and started passing stool and urine. <laughs> you, see, you see what happens to fanatics, right? <laughs> it was, you know, he was lecturing me every day, but you know, you don't have to pass stool and urine, and, you, know, you don't have to eat this prashadam, you know, you just eat these grains. He, he completely changed, you know, he let his hair grow, and. And he got to put his suit and tie on. He was a well-educated guy. 
as one of these people from Africa who came from a uh, highly, you know, educated family, and and he was well educated, you know. But you see, you see how people become crazy, and they become fanatical, you know. Yes. Uh, six days is nothing. They should check him for 150 days. Then, then we'd know for sure. You mean anyone can fast for six days? No, no. They have, and Indian Army has also tried him basically. They kept him for a month or more than that. Okay, there was one sadhu in that Delhi, and hundreds, thousands of people were going to see him because they said that he is a pure devotee. And how did they know he was a pure devotee? Because every time he sat and he began to speak, tears would fly out of his eyes. It would fly onto the people. And that for them, it was the proof that he was, he was God and he was pure devotee, right? So one man, he said, there must be some secret here that we're not seeing. So what did he do? He hid himself while, while he was giving a lecture. He hid himself in the man's room, like in a closet or something. And when the, the yogi came back after giving a lecture, you know, he, he locked the door and he sat down and he went like this. And he pulled a long red chili out of his nose. What was causing him to tear, and the tears were flying out of his eyes. They were just not going down like that. They were actually flying out of it. He had a very long, very hot chili that he would stick into his sinus. You can, you can go into your nose and it'll enter into the sinuses. And, and the sinuses are connected to your throat. It's like sometimes, you know, when, when you have mucus, it, you, you, it comes out into your throat and then you swallow it. So the sinuses are connected like that. And he had this chili all along his sinuses. And it caused him to tear like that. And people interpreted that as, you know, he's God. He's pure devotee. I mean, nobody else can shoot tears out of their eyes like that. But actually, it was a trick. So, you know, to, he fasts six days and they observe him. That's nothing. No, no not six days. Probably he's not eaten for so many days, basically. It means 40 years. And he's not like a money making or nothing like that. He is a simple wanderer sadhu. And uh, another thing is like, <coughs> he says how he gets the energy. So he has his own explanation. He, he says that- He gets, he gets it from the air. Air and the sun. And there is some hole in her, in his uh, mouth somewhere up here. And he gets some liquid from there. That's what he says. Doctor couldn't find that hole in his mouth. And, uh, in his tongue? About the tongue, uh -huh. you mean the the, the yeah. roof of his mouth? Yeah, roof of the mouth. So it's yeah. coming from somewhere. There. Coming from uh, yeah. the That's what he said, but the deva planets, right down through through his brahmarunda, right into his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> There's amrit, yeah. amrit. But Prabhu, what is the purpose of this? If we have this type of things, also it's not of any use because we are not uh, doing the main. Uh, goal of the life to please Krishna. Correct. Correct. Yeah. We're not doing things for, I mean, this, this friend that I had from Africa, he, anyway, everyone he would see would tell him, you know, I don't eat, I don't pass stool, you know. It was like, it made him special. So even this man, he's special. There, there's one Baba in India, they call him uh, the uh, the rolling Baba, because he doesn't walk, he rolls. He rolls from from Delhi to, uh, uh, what's that place, uh, Vaishnadevi, on the, in, on the street, he, he, he rolls. You ever hear of him? Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Other people, some people walk, some 
Many people do different things. Yeah. Some people will walk from Delhi to Vaishnav Devi. But this guy rolls on the ground. And he's, he's a very famous sadhu. He's very, very popular because... I don't know. That's just, that's his thing. He rolls. What they do in India, like, they go to uh, Devi's temple or uh, some temple and they will ask some for wish. Like, if the wish is fulfilled, then they will do all these things. So, some people will uh, lie down, mark a line, then again lie down, mark a line. No, they do Dandabad. Dandabad, Dandabad yeah, Parikram. Yeah. So, that's a the way People of do that. Vaishnavas do that in Govardhan. Yeah. yeah. They do Dandabad Parikram. So it could take them, it takes them sometimes two weeks to go all around. Yeah, yeah. And, and whatever they stop at night, they sleep right there. They don't, they don't, you know. So that's uh, the way everybody has their own way of showing respect to the Lord. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, nobody is free. This idea of freedom is an illusion. Everyone is conditioned by ignorance and the uh, laws of material nature. And because of that, everyone is suffering. Just like my friend, he ended up suffering because he was a fanatic. You know. Okay, go ahead. Yes. So, um, material people are doing all these things is fine. Means that they, they have a motive. But you said Vaishnavas are also doing uh, in gold and Vikrama. So, what is the motive behind doing this? Well, as he said, they, they make a vow to do some tapasya because. Maybe Krishna satisfied a desire, or they just want to do that tapasya to to control their senses and just focus on Govardhan. Yeah. Okay, let's go and continue. There is no freedom. So long as I am bound up in my conditions of nature, there is no. Freedom. Your, your microphone is not on. It's on. Take this one. The batteries go dead. There is no freedom. So long I am bound up in the conditions of nature, there is no freedom. Now here's a chance. Lord Krishna says that karma gyam buddhi yukta. Karma jam. Karma jam buddhi yukta. Now here is an opportunity for you. In the human form of life, you have got sufficient intelligence and the Lord himself is before you to enlighten your intelligence more and more here is a book this book is what spoke is what this book what is spoken by lord krishna and krishna is non different because krishna or the lord is on the absolute plane don't think that krishna is so absent non different than what than the book yes so the book bhagavad gita and Krishna are non-different. Also, Srimad Bhagavatam, yesterday, we read that the Srimad Bhagavatam is the incarnation of Krishna, Kali Yuga. Right. Go ahead. Krishna is present here. There is a verse in Bhagavad Gita, Tatra Tishtami Tishtami Narada Yukta Gaya Gayanti Mad Bhakta, that I, my dear Narada, Narada is a great devotee. Perhaps you, who are accustomed with Vedic literatures, you have heard of the name Narada. So Narada is a great devotee, and the Lord assures him that don't think that I am living in a kingdom. No, that don't think that I am living in the kingdom of God, or I am living in the heart of a great mystic or somewhere else, somewhere else. People may think, but I am living in a place where my sincere devotees assemble and dec discuss about myself. Yeah. Yatra Gayanti Mahad Bhakta. Wherever devotees are chanting Hare Krishna, he says in that verse, that's where I am. So when you go out on Sankirtan, like today, and you chant ecstatically Hare Krishna, the Lord is there with you. And whenever you sit down and chant, or chant the uh, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, the Lord is there with you. He's non-different than His holy name. 
he's not different than his kata. His, you know, he's speaking about his pastimes. Okay, that's the, that's the definition of absolute. Let's discuss this. What does absolute mean? Krishna is present. What? The definition that God is absolute means he's non different than his name. He's non different than his pastimes. He's non different than Govardhan. He proved that. How did he prove that he's non different than this mountain called Govardhan? Anybody know? Anybody know the pastime of Govardhan? What happened in that pastime? Picked up Govardhan with his little finger. Yeah, but see, his father had a doubt. Nanda Maharaj had a doubt. So how can you say? How can you worship a mountain? He said, "There's no, there's no evidence in the in the Vedas of worshiping a mountain." He, you know, because Krishna said, "Don't worship Indra, worship Govardhan." Well, there's plenty of evidence in the Rig Veda that you know Indra can be worshipped. Right. There's so many sacrifices that should be offered to Indra. So how did Krishna prove that worshipping Govardhan is actually bona fide? Because he is Govardhan. Huh? Because he is Govardhan. How did he show that? Yes. He lifted like this big mountain with his pinky. So no. like. No. He like, no, but doesn't it Something show. Something else he did. You're getting closer, but he, there's something else that he did. Uh, what? <laughs> you have to think, think of the pastime. Think of the pastime. There's something that he did after he lifted oh, it up. After he talks to Indra, right? And then um, Indra puts his crown down and pays obeisances to Lord Krishna. And, oh, no, that doesn't explain. Now, actually, it happened before he lifted the mountain. Before. What did he do before he lifted the mountain? <laughs> to show everybody that he's not different than Govardhan. What he did was. Okay, well, I'll probably explain. Give him the microphone. Govardhan Hill assumed the form and began to eat all the, all the prasadam. The mountain began to, and he began to speak. He said, give me more, more, more. And he ate all the food. So Krishna showed he is not different from Govardhan. Well, actually, also, also at one point, Krishna manifested his form his form as big as Govardhan, just as big as Govardhan. But Krishna was still there in his, in his seven-year-old form. And he also bowed down with everyone else when they saw this gigantic form of himself right next to the mountain. And then everyone understood there's no difference between Krishna and the mountain. He manifested a form as big as the mountain and, but simultaneously, he, the seven-year-old Krishna bowed down with everybody else when they saw the form. Then they understood there's no difference between the mountain and, and, and Krishna. What are you going to say? No. Uh, why we pray Indra? Because earlier they were praying Indra for the same uh, event. So they said that Indra is giving rain, and that's how the things works, uh, basically. Well, they're farmers; they need yeah. the rain. Yeah. Then uh, Krishna said uh, he was trying to convince them that uh, why Govardhan, because all the cows from Vrindavan used to go to Govardhan Hill. They used to fed grasses. They used to get all food. I mean, the fruits from the mountains. That mountain, basically. So everything was coming from the mountain. And the grass is feeding, uh, feeding grass there, and they were giving nice milk, and all those things were there. So th I think one point was that also. Well, that 
That was how he convinced his father. But no, th what happened was that when the, they started circumambulating the mountain, the Govardhan, Krishna told him, he explained to his father how to worship Govardhan because the father didn't know. He said, how do you worship a mountain? So there's no in indication in the Vedas how to do that. So he said, you make big piles of, prashad, of food and bring the Brahmins and bring the cows and you uh, worship the cows and the Brahmins chant the mantras and they offer the food to the mountain. But to prove to them that they were not just worshiping a mountain, he simultaneously manifested a form of himself as big as the mountain. And everyone was like overwhelmed. They were like shocked. They suddenly saw that the mountain and Krishna are non different. And everyone bowed down, including Krishna himself. So here you have Krishna in a gigantic form, yeah. and you have Krishna in his uh, seven year form, <coughs> you know, simultaneously. Yes? So is this uh, a way for Krishna to teach other people that like, you know, worshipping the demigods is more like from a game to game, whereas worshipping the Supreme? Well, the whole, the whole idea of Govardhan Puja is to stop demigod worship. It's not necessary. Correct. That's, that's the point. Yeah, that's the whole point of it. You know, it's, it's, Krishna showed it's not, it's not necessary to worship the demigods. You, you respect them, but you don't have to worship them. You just worship Krishna, the demigods are going to be satisfied also. More than if you worship them directly. And you don't get any material benefits from the demigods. You get everything from Krishna. You don't have to go to demigods for material benefits. Correct. Yeah. Okay, let, let's get the Krishna book. There should be a Krishna book somewhere. And we'll read this just to make sure I didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> okay, in the meantime, let's read. Go ahead. Microphone. So here we should always understand that if we sincerely and seriously take up the message of the Bhagavad Gita as it is, without any, I mean to say, adulteration, sometimes it is adulterated by, because Bhagavad Gita is a very authoritative book and it is pop. Po uh, popular all over the world. Sometimes people take advantage of this book and present their own theory in an adulterated way. Not to speak not to speak of any others, I may tell you frankly that even in our country the greatest, I mean to say saintly politician Mahatma Gandhi, he propound, prof propounded, uh, propounded a philosophy of nonviolence. Perhaps you know, everyone you, every one of you, that he propounded nonviolence. Uh, every one of you. Oh, okay. Every one of you. Every one of you that he propounded nonviolence, and he wanted to prove nonviolence from the Bhagavad Gita. He has not, and. He has not got an 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 uh, annotation. What? Not annotation of annotation. Bhagavad Gita. What does annotation mean? Annotation means something that you write down. Oh, okay. And he has tried to prove that Bhagavad Gita, there is proof nonviolence, but actually Bhagavad Gita is being spoken on the battlefield battlefield where everyone is prepared to start violence simply for a moment when arjuna was disturbed in his mind that how can i fight with my relatives and friends and sons and grandsons and so so many things bodily relations and the bhagavad gita was spoken so that is the practical thing that bhagavad gita was practically spoken to induce Arjuna about nonviolence, huh? <coughs> oh, induce Arjuna to adopt non to adopt violence. Now Mahatma Gandhi, this philosophy was nonviolence. His philosophy was nonviolence. 
How could he prove that Bhagavad Gita gives evidence of nonviolence? No, there for anyone, Mahatma Gandhi or anyone who has got his own ulterior motive to prove it from the topics of Bhagavad Gita, he must adulterate it. But that is not the process of reading Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita, how to read Bhagavad Gita, that is stated in Bhagavad Gita. When we come to the fourth chapter, we'll know. We'll know. So anyways, apart from the process of but rest assured, we are speaking here of the Bhagavad Gita as it is. We are not going to add, add in add in it something for filling our own philosophy, our own points of view. Now, here Krishna says that okay. if... Okay, wait a second. Wait a second. So, it says, when uh, everything was complete, in other words, uh, er, the, all the food was ready to be offered, the brahmanas were ready to chant the mantras and act as priests for Govardhan Puja. And the cows were there, and the gopis, and everyone was there. And people started to circumambulate the mountain. Then it says, when everything was complete, Krishna assumed a great transcendental form and declared to the inhabitants of Vrindavan that he was himself Govardhan Hill in order to convince the devotees that Govardhan Hill and Krishna himself are identical. Then Krishna began to eat all the food offered there. The identity of Krishna and Govardhan Hill is still honored, and great devotees take rocks from Govardhan Hill and worship them exactly as they worship the deity of Krishna in the temples. The followers of the Krishna Conscious Movement may therefore collect small rocks or pebbles from Govardhan Hill and worship them at home because this worship is as good as deity worship. The form of Krishna who began to eat the offerings was separately constituted, and Krishna himself also, with the other inhabitants of Vrindavan, offered obeisances to the deity as well as Govardhan Hill. In offering obeisances to the huge form of Krishna and Govardhan Hill, Krishna declared, just see how Govardhan Hill has assumed this huge form and is favoring us by accepting all the offerings. Krishna also declared at that meeting, one who neglects the worship of Govardhan Puja, as I am personally conducting it, will not be happy. There are many snakes on Govardhan Hill, and persons neglecting the prescribed duty of Govardhan Puja will be bitten by these snakes and killed. In order to assume the good fortune of the cows and themselves, all people of Vrindavan near Govardhan must worship the hill, the hill as prescribed by me. Thus performing the Govardhan Puja sacrifice all the inhabitants of Vrindavan have followed the instructions of Krishna, the son of Vasudeva, and afterwards they returned to their respective homes. So you see, he assumed the form, he declared that he's non-different than Govardhan, but at the same time, he was there also as a seven-year-old boy, the son of Nanda Maharaj, right? So, I mean, this, that's called simultaneous and inconceivable oneness and difference, right? And then he started, as Prabhu said, he started to eat all the all the offerings. So this is the way he proved to his father and all the inhabitants of Vrindavan that they were not doing something strange. So this is the definition of absolute. Everything comes from Krishna. So therefore, Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna. So write this down. Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna. What does that mean? Sai. Ah, uh, is that the answer? Uh. material world like uh, Krishna's energies created the material world but the material world cannot be compared to Krishna because he's unlimited and he's infinite he's not affected by those modes and he's aloof from it 
Yes, in a sense, yes. Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna. Let's hear some more. Okay, go ahead. Uh, get, give her the microphone. Is it like, so when you say Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna, is it like this book, or let's say Shreshta, she contains Krishna in her, but Shreshta is not Krishna herself? I didn't understand your example. <laughs> so, what about Shreshta? No, <laughs> no, it doesn't apply to Shreshta, but it applies to everyone. But like, Krishna. You're, not, you're, you're mumbling your words, okay. so speak slowly and pronounce each word distinctly so we understand what you said. Otherwise, <laughs> you understand what you said. We didn't understand one word. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, Krishna's in Shrestha. Krishna's in Shrestha? No, no. <laughs> yeah, Krishna's in Shrestha as Paramatma, but Krishna's not Shrestha herself. You mean? Shrestha is not Krishna. Yeah, Shrestha is not Krishna. But Krishna is always himself. Yeah, but Shrestha is not Krishna, but Krishna is inside Shrestha as Paramatma. Okay, but uh, now, now give me give the same example using a car instead of Shrestha. Oh, 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 I get it. Okay, no. <laughs> the, all the materials, materials of the car, yes. if you, like, it, well, what are it, those like, materials? Um, like the metal, the earth, oh, water, yeah, earth, water, fire, 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 air, ether. ether, right? It all leads back to Krishna. It's coming from Krishna. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So is the car? Is Krishna the car? No, but all the materials come from him. No, all the materials come from him. So in one sense, Krishna is the car, but yeah. is the car Krishna? No. No. Why? Because the car doesn't play the flute, yeah. doesn't dance with the gopis, yeah. does not, does, is not the source of all matter. Is, uh, the, the, the jivas don't emanate from the car. The incarnations of Krishna don't come from the car. So, but the car is in one sense, but, but Krishna is in one sense the car because all the energy, the earth, water, fire, it's all coming from Krishna. So what do you do when you open your mouth like that and yawn? Huh? So you tell me. What do, you do? Do, you, do you laugh? What do you do? You put your hand in front of your mouth. Yeah, okay, good. So you are your mouth, but the mouth is not you, right? Okay. So this is, this is the meaning of absolute. Absolute means that because everything emanates from Krishna, Krishna is non-different than everything. But at the same time, everything is not Krishna. Yes? So is it kind of like how like if, if a child is born to a mother, like it it contains some it's made of like from the, the body it, is made from mother's yeah, body. Yeah. It, it has some genes that are from its mother, but it is not its mother completely. And don't talk about genes because that <laughs> is nonsense. No, the the body of the child is made from the mother, yeah. mother's body, right? But the child is not the mother. When when does the mother realize it? When the child becomes 12, 13 years old and says, "Mom, I'm not going to do what you're telling me to do." That's when the mom realizes all of a sudden, "Oh, wait a minute, <laughs> this is not." I thought this belonged to me, but it doesn't belong to me actually because now she's saying I don't want to do what you say. <laughs> then you realize you know, the child is a unique individual. Even though the body of the child is made from the body of the mother, there's a, there's a unique soul in the body. Right? Okay. So the same way everything we see in this creation is made from Krishna's energy. So Krishna is everything in one sense. But you can't say the dog is Krishna. You can't say the tree is Krishna. You can't say the dog emanated from Krishna and part and parcel of Krishna, but Krishna is not a dog. If, 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 if you say 
that Krishna has everything and everything is Krishna, then you can pick up the dog, put him on the altar, and start doing arti to him. You could. But it's not true. Yes, every, Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna. Do you understand that? Now, when Krishna comes and he's a, a little baby or is a child, seven years old, and he tells his father to worship Govardhan, and the father, you know, he, he is very reluctant to do it because he says, there's no evidence in the Vedas to worship a mountain. And why this mountain? Why can't we worship another mountain? You know, he's saying specifically this mountain. So Krishna then manifests a form as big as the mountain. And he's still there as, as the baby Krishna, right? And he tells people in that big form, I'm, I am not different than this mountain. And then he starts to eat the food. Now the people have no doubt in their mind that this Govardhan is non different. So that's absolute. Absolute means in the form of the deity, the deity is non different than Krishna. The holy name is non different than Krishna. But you will realize this as you become more purified. As we become more purified, we realize that the name of Krishna and Krishna are non different. Right now, we don't realize it. Yes. Microphone. So, for example, the example Shreshta said was like how the, mo the, ba the mother is not the baby. And the baby is not, the, not mother. the mother, right? Yeah. But you said we know that because um, the baby gets like a separate soul, right? So it gets like a new soul. It's not a new soul. I mean, it's just, it's, it's it's a, just a different soul. Yeah, a different soul. It's not the soul right. of the mother. Yeah, so... The like body that, comes from the mother. Yeah, yeah. So you can differentiate the mother from the baby. But then Krishna, like his energy is like he, from his... he. Um, earth, water, fire, they all come from Krishna. But then, like, what differentiates Krishna from, I mean, Krish like, this carpet from Krishna? Like, you said that this carpet can't produce, I mean, like, um, play the flute and stuff like that. But is there any reason, like, like the soul and the mother and the baby? Okay. Is there any reason like that? Here, here's the point. There's one thing we didn't mention. Although the energy, earth, water, fire, air, ether, all come from Krishna, he's also present in every atom of the material energy. Every atom of earth, every atom of water, every atom of, you know, air. So, therefore, in many ways, not, not just one way, he is everything. But everything is not him. Why? Because everything can't do what he does. He's independent. He's not, he is, because he expands this energy and he enters it as Paramatma, but still he's independent. Like if you expand yourself, like uh, let's say you have a child, right? It's an expansion of, of a mom's body. And, and but the father is involved also. He's not, he's, so it's expansion of the mother and father. But the child, it's a different individual. The mother and father are not in every atom of the child's body, right? But Krishna is. That means, who does the child belong to? Let's discuss that. Does it belong to the mother and father? Huh? No, it belongs to Krishna. It or she or he belongs to Krishna. It doesn't belong to mother and father. Mother and father think the child belongs to me, but it's to them, but actually it's not true. They're not present in every atom of the child's body. They're not present in the heart of the child as Paramatma, you see? So unless you get this concept clear, you develop this separatism. You, you separate things from Krishna out of ignorance. Like the child belongs to me, the car belongs to me because I paid for it. And I paid, on the, I paid the insurance, therefore it belongs to me. Actually, it's not true. The car belongs to Krishna. And whatever you have, 
including your own children. They actually belong to Krishna. And the husband is saying, this is my wife, she belongs to me. Actually, it's not true. The wife also belongs to Krishna. And he said, well, at least my body belongs to me. That's not true either. <laughs> His body belongs to Krishna and the intelligence, you see. So unless we get these concepts clear in our mind, we do not end up becoming sincere devotees. We, we might be a half devotee. Half means it's not really a devotee. Either you're whole or you're not, right? So you have to have the whole understanding of Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna. Krishna is absolute. We're not absolute, right? Krishna is present in every atom of the universe. We're not present in every atom of the universe. Krishna is all-knowing. We're not all-knowing. Yes? I just wanted to also add that it's not only the matter, even the soul. Yeah. I also belong to Krishna. I also belong to My soul belongs to Krishna. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Actually, you're not allowed to take a stone from Govardhan. Yeah. You, someone has, a Brahmin or a resident of Govardhan has to give it to you. If you, if you take the stone, uh, anyway, it's not proper. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So, I was trying to break some, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> somebody told me you're going there to get some stone from there. Yes. Yeah. Well, they read something. You know, Prabhupada says it there in the Krishna book, but upon further inquiry, he said, no, we, you know, just, if everyone just went and took a stone, there'd be no go for that. Yeah, I was going the same thing. <laughs> 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 they, they were just taking it all away. There were many, many stones made up for them. But uh, some... Give them the microphone. Some devotee, you know, a spiritual, spiritual master, for instance, he, may, he can give you a stone from Govardhan and instruct you how to worship it. Like Lord Chaitanya? Lord Chaitanya, he used to have, he got a stone from Govardhan and he used to bathe the stone with his tears instead of regular water. And he worshipped that stone and he'd rub his head with that stone. And that stone, he gave it to Raghunath Das Goswami. And now that same Govardhan stone, it's a small little stone, is in Vrindavan in one of the temples. Radha Gokulananda Temple. Wow. And if you go there, after Arti, the Pajari will bring that stone, Govardhan Shila, on a cushion, so you can have darshan. Wow. But uh, it's not that, it's not a free for all that anybody just go and grab a stone. It's very inauspicious to do that. Mm -hmm. Actually, somebody wanted to give me a stone at one time. And they got, they wanted to give me a big rock. I was going around Govardhan. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, no, I, I don't want. When someone, a, a resident? No, he wasn't a resident. It was a god brother of mine. Oh. <laughs> and where did he get it from? From Govardhan. He just took it. He just walked up the hill and he looked for one and he said, he was getting one for a, for a temple. And he thought he, he wanted to give me one also. And I said, thanks, but no thanks. Because I knew Prabhupada had said, we shouldn't just go, everybody go, anybody, everybody. Well, those people that don't know are the people that don't come to class. <laughs> you want to know, you have to come to class. There's so many things we have to know. Yeah. Uh, Uh, from a qualified person, 
for the creation of whatever it may be. Yeah. Yes. Then it should be acceptable. Because it's given with the knowledge of how to properly worship. Right? You just take something, you don't you don't know what to do. You might think it's just an ordinary stone. You know, by the way, whether it's Govardhan or Shalagram, you commit a, an offense. It's extremely severe reaction. I saw a person who was worshiping Shalagram very opulently, and he committed an offense once. His life was devastated. His life was devastated. I saw it with my own eyes. And not, not, not right away, but after he committed that offense to his own Shalagram Shila, uh, very soon after that, he had his head cut off. I'm not kidding you, his head was cut off, right? Because he committed some serious offenses. So we have to be very careful mm -hmm. about uh, what we do. Now, if you have Gorni Thai deities, the Lord never accepts any offense. You know, Lord Chaitanya does not, does not, you know. In fact, let me read that so you, you know where that comes from. <clears throat> Prabhupada is written in the explanation, the purport to the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And he says that When the mantra is chanted by a pure devotee of the Lord in love, it has the greatest efficacy on the hearers. And as such, this chanting should be heard from the lips of a pure devotee of the Lord so that immediate effects can be achieved. As far as possible, chanting from the lips of non-devotees should be avoided just as milk touched by the lips of a serpent should be avoided because of its poisonous effect. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I'm going to have to look at it more carefully. Uh, all right, we'll come back to this point. He says it's in this article. I'm not seeing it. So I'll come back to it. All right. So now your homework is to explain what is the meaning of Krishna as absolute. And secondly, explain what is the understanding that Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna? Okay. And now we're going to read what Shrestha wrote for last week's homework, right? Yes, Arush. Okay. Explain what is meant that Krishna is absolute. What does that mean? And then secondly, Explain what, what is meant by Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna. Okay? Uh, the homework is two parts. One is that, uh, explain what is the meaning of the, the, that Krishna is absolute. What does that mean? And give examples also. And then secondly, Explain what is meant by Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna. Okay, and now Shrestha will read what she wrote. Do you have it, or I have it on my computer, but, huh? All right, so here it is.
Shrestha Apala Batula. I got it right? Apala Batula. Okay, give this to her, let her read it. That's right. She, uh, she can read it. So the question was, how do we engage everything we do in our daily life to Krishna consciousness? And um, the verses, the verses were 2.48 to 2.50 and 9.26, I believe, in the Bhagavad Gita. And so, a person who is always engaged in pure devotional service or working for Krishna will get rid of the bad and good reactions in his lifetime and get liberated from the cycle of birth and death. Whereas a person who works for satisfying his senses gets entrapped in this vicious cycle. Krishna describes this pure devotional service as the art of all work in Bhagavad Gita 2.50. A man engaged in devotional service rids himself of both good and bad reactions even in this life. Therefore, strive for yoga, which is the art of all work. The purpose of buddhi yoga, or art of all work, is to understand that Krishna is the proprietor of this entire material and spiritual existence, and it is our duty to serve him. He has rented out this body, which has highly evolved instruments like the senses, mind, and the intelligence. If one uses it carefully in his service, one will be self-realized. However, if we begin to believe that the purpose of this body is for sense gratification, we become a victim of our own ignorance. We will waste the human birth with this highly evolved instruments that Krishna has provided by engaging them in sense gratification, like animals, and destroy our path to our destiny. We need to understand that the material nature is the energy of Krishna. Real education is learning how to use a material nature in the service of Krishna and not for the sense gratification. If we learn this under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master and transform everything material into spiritual reality, at that point our life becomes su successful. The art of reorienting daily activities that we perform in our day-to-day -day life for pleasing Krishna can be learned by coming to the temple. At the temple we see the beautiful form of the deities with their eyes we fix our mind on the lotus feet of Krishna. We use our head to offer obeisances to Krishna. We smell the, uh, the, we smell the flowers offered to Krishna. We touch the lotus feet of the Lord. We hear the kirtans for Krishna. We hear Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam. We dance for the kirtans. We use our arms to make garlands, clean the dishes in the kitchen, clean the temple floor. We eat the prasadam and we talk about Krishna's pastimes and glorify Krishna and his pure devotees. Similarly, we can ex extend this to our daily activities outside the temple. Sleeping. To wake up early to serve the deity in the house and chant the Maha Mantra. Bathing. To clean yourself so you can serve Krishna. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll finish after the greeting of deities. This is an A++ effort that she's made here. This is like a perfect answer. And I found that quote I was looking for. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Yashomati Nandana Brajabara Nagara Gokula Ranjana Kana Yashomati Nandana Brajabara Nagara Gokula Ranjana Kana Gopi Paranadana Madana Manohara Gopi Paranadana Madana Manohara Kaliya Damana Vidana Amala Harina Mamiya Vilasa Amala Hari Nam Vilasa Vipina Purandara Navina Nagara Bora
वंशी बदान सुवासा प्रजन पालन सुरकुल नासना ब्रजन पालन सुरकुल नासना नंद गुदन रखवाला गोविंद माधव नवनीत तस्कर गोविंद माधव नवनीत तस्कर सुंदर नंद गोपाला आमून टट चर गोपी बसन हर यमून टट चर गोपी बसन हर रस रसिक कृप मोया श्री राधा वल्लभ वृंदवन नट वर श्री राधा वल्लभ वृंदवन नट वर भक्ति विनोद भक्ति विनोद यशोमति नंदन ब्रजबर नागर गोकुल रंजन काना चयो राधा नील माधव राधा नील माधव राधे नील माधव राधा नील माधव राधे जय सीता राम जय सीता राम जय सीता राम जय लक्ष्मण हनुमान पिता गौर हरि बो हरि बो हरि बोल नीता गौर हरि बो नीता गौर हरि बो हरि बो हरि बो नीता गौर हरि बो
The quote I was looking for is the following. It says, Therefore, our obeisances to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are complete when we say, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhara, Sri Vasudhi Gora Bhaktivinda. As preachers of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, we first offer our obeisances to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by chanting this Panchatattva Mantra. Then we say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. There are 10 offenses in the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, but these are not considered in the chanting of the Panchatattva Mantra, namely, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasudhi Gaur Bhaktivinda. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is known as the Maha Vadanya Avatara, the most magnanimous, magnanimous incarnation, or meaning the most generous incarnation. For he does not consider the offenses of the fallen souls. Um, um, uh, yes. Thus, to derive the full benefit from chanting the Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare, we must first take shelter of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu learn the Panchatattva Mantra, and then chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, that will be very effective. So now we learn something new, that Lord Chaitanya does not accept any offenses. I mean, in other words, he's not, he's very merciful, right? So he does not consider the offenses of the fallen souls. Therefore, before we start chanting Hare Krishna, we should first chant, Shri Chaitanya, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasudhi Gaura Bhaktivinda and take shelter of Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Learn this Maha Mantra, learn the Panchatattva Mantra and then chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Then it's most effective. Okay. Hari Bo. So now it's just a, why don't you start again from the beginning because what you've written is so good we should all hear it a second time without rushing through it. Go ahead. So how do we engage everything we do in our daily life to Krishna consciousness? A person who is always engaged in pure devotional service, working for Krishna, will get rid of the bad and good reactions in his lifetime and gets liberated from the cycle of birth and death. Whereas a person who works for satisfying his senses gets entrapped in this vicious cycle. Krishna describes this pure devotional service, working for Krishna, as the art of all work in Bhagavad Gita 2.50. A man engaged in devotional service rids himself of both good and bad reactions, even in this life. Therefore, strive for yoga, which is the art of all work. The purpose of buddhi yoga, or art of all work, is to understand that Krishna is the proprietor of this entire material and spiritual existence, and it is our duty to serve, to serve him. He has rented out this body, which has highly evolved instruments like the senses, mind, and the intelligence. If one uses it carefully on his service, one will be self-realized. However, if we begin to believe that the purpose of this body is for sense gratification, we become a victim of our own ignorance. We will waste the human birth with this highly evolved instruments that Krishna has provided by engaging them in sense gratification, like animals, and destroy our path to destiny. It actually should be, we will waste the human birth with these highly evolved instruments not this oh. these highly evolved instruments yes um. we need to understand that the material nature is the energy of krishna real education is learning how to use the material nature in the service of krishna and not for the sense, sense gratification if we learn this under uh, the actually it's better english to say and not for sense gratification okay. no, i take out the mm -hmm. So not for sense gratification. If we learn this under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master and transform everything material into spiritual reality, at that point our life becomes successful. 
The art of reorienting daily activities that we perform in our day-to-day -day life for pleasing Krishna can be learned by coming to the temple. At the temple, we see the beautiful form of the deities. We fix our mind on the lotus feet of Krishna. We use our head to offer obeisances to Krishna. We smell the flowers offered to Krishna. We touch the lotus feet of the Lord. We hear the Krishna Kirtans, Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam. We dance for the Krishna Kirtans. We use our arms to make garlands, clean the dishes in the kitchen, clean the temple floors. We eat the Krishna Prasad and we talk about Krishna's pastimes and glorify Krishna and his pure devotees. Okay, we use our arms, we use our hands to make garlands. Yeah, hands. Yeah. Go ahead. Similarly, we can extend this to our daily activities outside the temple. Sleep. To wake up early to serve the deity in the house and chant the Maha Mantra. Take bath. To go clean yourself so you can serve Krishna. Going to school. Learn skills which will help you to serve Krishna. Eat, for example, you can read uh, language so that you can read Krishna books. Reading. Reading the Vedas. Talking. Talking about Krishna. Cooking for Krishna. Eating. F eating food that is only offered to Krishna. Cleaning. Keeping the home and temple clean for the Lordships. Working. Earn money to sustain and use the extras in the service of the Lord. Shopping. Shop for Krishna. For example, buying ornaments for the deities, buying fruits and flowers. Buying a house to establish the deity of Krishna and host spiritual activities. Singing. Singing the kirtans glorifying Krishna. Dancing. Dancing to the kirtans. Plans. Plans. To fulfill the desire of Krishna and Guru. Social media and technology. So instead of plans, you put desires. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Social media and technology used for the outreach of Krishna's activities, networking, for spreading the word of Krishna, and raising funds for Krishna's activities. Therefore, one who performs everyday activities and engages his senses for pleasing Krishna under the guidance of a spiritual master and gives up all attachment to success and failure, happiness and distress, the dualities in this life, can get liberated from this karma bandhana and attain the Krishna prema. Excellent. Very good. Okay, so I hope you remember this the rest of your life. Okay, Arush first, and then, how do you say his name again? Huh? How do you say? Huh? S-A-M? A. S-A-M-A? -A R. R. T. T. H. Samart. Okay. What does it mean? Okay. That's a Sanskrit name? Yeah, okay. Samart. Okay, good. All right, go ahead, Ravish. The question was explain how all the ordinary things you do for Krishna, you can do for Krishna. Answer, you can do work for Krishna by using the money that you get for boga for Krishna. You can sleep for Krishna to give energy to your body and to go to Mangalarti. You can have kids only if you teach them Krishna culture. Krishna culture means that you do things to please Krishna. These simple Krishna culture techniques were made from experienced devotees. On the other side, people who think I can smoke for Krishna and Krishna will be happy, but that is wrong because if you are breaking the, one of the f four regulated principles, Krishna will not accept it. Also. If you are doing things for your sense enjoyment, like playing Fortnite game, then Krishna will not be pleased. Yes. Okay, very good. And Samart. Um. Give him the microphone. Mm -hmm. I was going to do a final draft, but then I locked it. Question, how can you relate everyday activities to Krishna culture? Um. First, we need to understand why we should do everything related to Krishna culture. 
From 9.26, it says, For the intelligent person, it is essential to begin Krishna consciousness engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord in order to achieve a permanent blissful abode from, for the eternal happiness. Now, we need to understand how we can relate the activities to Krishna culture. Waking up. We can relate this to Krishna culture by waking up early and chanting, brushing teeth and taking bath. We can relate this to Krishna culture because cleanliness is godliness, because the Paramatma is there in your heart. Good. Very good. Eating food. Eating food that is offered to Krishna. Going to school to learn skills which will help you serve Krishna. Talking. Talking about Krishna, singing, singing kirtans of Krishna, dancing, dancing for Krishna's kirtans, working, working for un earning money to uh, donate to the temple. Reading, reading Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. Playing, playing games like on the way home and laws of nature. Exercise, to keep your body fit so you can serve Krishna. Watching TV, watch Krishna movie. Facebook Live, watch Vedic Cultural Center. Cleaning, cleaning the deity room. Smelling, smelling flowers offered to Krishna. Seeing, seeing the deities. Hearing. Krishna's lectures and stories. Touching, touching Krishna's feet. Tasting, Krishna's prasadam. Thus, by dovetailing our daily activities to Krishna consciousness, one can get liberated and go back to Goloka Vrindavan. Jai. Hari oh, Haribo, very good. So that you can become Krishna just by doing the ordinary activities that you do every day, but just direct them toward pleasing Krishna. You don't have to change anything, you just change the purpose. Anybody else did the homework? Yes, Rhea, first Rhea. You were the microphone, speak into the microphone. Well, you hold it for Rhea, hold it for Rhea. Go ahead, Rhea, you just read, go ahead. Okay, um, when, you cook, when you cook, you cook for Krishna, you eat so you can stay fit to serve Krishna, you sleep so you can be rested to work for Krishna. You work so you can earn money to donate to Krishna. You talk so you can chant and preach for Krishna. You shop so you can buy clothes and jewelry for grain for Krishna. You read, you read so you can read the Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures for Krishna. You go to school so you can study and become eligible to work and earn money for Krishna. You bathe so you can be clean to serve Krishna. Very good. Very, very good. So you're just doing the ordinary things that you do anyway, but you learn how to do it for Krishna. Then you become liberated just by doing the ordinary things. Anybody else? Okay. Krishna won. His name is Krishna won now. He graduated from two to one. <laughs> I kind of messed up on the 9.26, I got a different verse, but um, I'll just say what I have. We do normal things every day, and we can, all, uh, we can make them all in use for Krishna's service. This is called following Krishna culture. Culture means how we do things, but Krishna culture means how we do things to serve Krishna. For example, we sleep to have energy for Krishna. We make money so that we can buy and offer food to Krishna. We exercise so that we can stay fit and strong to carry things around in festivals and there are a lot more reasons. <laughs> um. Good point. <laughs> then you can use marijuana also in Christian service by throwing it away. <laughs> yeah. okay. 9.26 now. It says that if one offers me with love and devotion a leaf, flower, fruit or water, I will accept it. I got like the wrong verse. So here Krishna says that he is the enjoyer, that he is the primeval Lord, he is the real object of all sacrificial things, and what offerings he likes to be given. Without knowing this, we cannot follow Krishna culture properly. We need to understand that he is the enjoyer, pri the primeval Lord, 
the real object of all sacrificial things and what he would like to have as an offering. This will help us serve him very well and as well as do Krishna culture. Excellent. Very good. Augustia. The homework was explain how all the ordinary things you do, how to do it for Krishna. Yeah. So, basically for all things you need to use yoga so you can connect everything you do to Krishna. For example, when you exercise, you use yoga and find out by keeping your body fit and strong, you can serve Krishna longer. And by being strong, you can lift heavy boxes that contain Krishna thing, Krishna's things. Another example is shopping. You can do many things with shopping. You could buy a new pan for cooking for shadam. You could buy wood for making a small temple. And when you buy anything, you can offer it to Krishna. And for talking, you can talk only about Krishna and things related to Krishna. And when you cook, you only cook Krishna conscious foods and you offer before eating. Very good. Anybody else? Sanskriti? Yeah. She did it. She is one. She she had a lead. So. Okay. Hit the microphone. We can connect the ordinary things we do with Krishna by doing everything for Krishna and always thinking about Krishna. Save Namaha Krishna Padha. What cursive. is it? It's in cursive, so I don't know. Oh, it's Srimad Bhagavatam 9.4.18. A devotee does not waste a single moment without thinking of Krishna. Krishna consciousness means always thinking of Krishna, and Krishna culture means doing everything for Krishna. This, everything we do, will be connected with Krishna. A person in Krishna culture will cook to cook so that Krishna can eat and will remain fit so that they can serve Krishna properly. In Krishna culture, a person can do all the normal things they do for Krishna. Okay, that's it, right? Very good. All right, so now you have your homework for next week. And and we'll continue with this lecture next, oh no, what do you mean next week? Tomorrow. So you have your homework for tomorrow, right? So yeah, you're gonna explain what it means that Krishna is, is absolute with examples. And I gave you a hint of Govardhan Puja example, right? Where Krishna manifested a form as big as the mountain to prove that he's not different than the mountain. Yes, Rhea? Yes, yes. Ninth chapter, fourth verse. Yeah, Mayatitam Bidam Sarvam Jagat. Ninth chapter, fourth verse, 9 4. Mayatitam Bidam Sarvam. Mayatitam Bidam Sarvam Jagat. Avyakta Murtina. Matstani Sarvabhutani Nachaham Te Suvastita. Krishna says, by me, in my unmanifested form, this entire universe is pervaded. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. Right? So, huh? Yes, that'll help you answer the second one. But it all it also is related to the first one, because. is where it says in a purport, in the seventh chapter, the entire material cosmic manifestation is only a combination of its two different energies, the superior spiritual energy and the inferior material energy. Just as the sunshine is spread all over the universe, the energy of the Lord is spread all over the creation and everything is resting on that energy. So that means that Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna, but also, Krishna is absolute. He's, he's not different than his name, Govardhan Mountain. He's not different than Vrindavan. And he's not different than his pet.
pastimes and, his, and, and the recitation of his pastimes. So, because he pervades the entire universe in its unmanifested form. What form is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the uh, Paramatma, but also he's talking about his effulgence called the Brahma Jyoti. Uh, so everything is resting on the Brahma Jyoti and he is present in everything as Paramatma. Okay. So it says in this purport to 9.4, one should not conclude that because Krishna has spread all over, he has lost his personal existence. To refute such an argument, the Lord says, I am everywhere and everything is in me but still I am aloof. For example, a king heads a government which is but the manifestation of the king's energy. The different governmental departments are nothing but the energies of the king and each department is resting on the king's power, but still one cannot expect the king to be present in every department personally. That is a crude example. Similarly, all manifestations that we see and everything that exists, both in the material and the spiritual world, are resting on the energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The creation takes place by the diffusion of his different energies, and as stated in Bhagavad Gita, Vistab Yaham Idam Krishnam, he is everywhere present by his personal representation, the diffusion of his different energies. So that's referring to another verse in the 10th, 10th chapter, the uh, last verse, it says, Atavai Bahunaitena Kim Gyatena Tavarjana Vistabhyaham Idam Krishnam Ekam Sena Stito Jagat. But what need is there, Arjuna, for all this detailed knowledge? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support this entire universe. So the whole universe is maintained by Paramatma. Okay, so that's 10th chapter, verse 42. Chapter 10, verse 42. So Krishna is everything, but everything is not Krishna. And Krishna has, is absolute, meaning he's non-different from everything that is coming from him. But everything is not him at the same time. Okay, so you have your homework for tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Advitya did his homework. Oh, Advitya, well, okay. Advitya, Advitya, yeah, Advitya, you did your homework? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. You gonna read it? I didn't do it. Oh, what? I didn't do it. How come you say he did it? <laughs> what? <laughs> come on, Advitya. Go ahead, give him the microphone, let him read. You sh uh, the question was explain how all the ordinary things you do for Krishna. Uh, my answer was you should do all your activities for Krishna. Yeah. Uh, the example, example cooking, uh, you should clean your DT's utensils separately, not with the utensils you eat. And another example, it is not hard to offer Krishna food, but people in, who are in sense gratification, they offer once in two days maybe. You can connect everything you do by doing yoga. That way you surrender all your activities to Krishna. Okay, very good. Haribo, Haribo. Thank you. Okay, so now we will stop and try and do your homework for tomorrow. Hare Krishna.
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I want to say thank you for all the things you're doing for the community as a guru to help me advance in Krishna consciousness. This time with you is very precious every second of it. You treat me like a father and your association is the best anyone can have. You teach me new things and life lessons that help me advance in Krishna consciousness and how to deal with things outside of Krishna consciousness like school. Without you, I would not be worth anything. But when you helped me understand the scriptures, I have realized the true meaning of life thanks to you, and I now know the meaning of life is not to play video games and earn money, it is to follow Krishna culture. So I just want to say thank you for all that you are doing to help the community advance in Krishna consciousness, all the time you are taking to give us classes to open our eyes to this material and cataract and things for education. Very nice. Let me, let me have that. We'll have, we'll have it read today. That was very good. Hare Krishna, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Advitya, Advitya, right? Yeah. Thank you, Ria, Hare Krishna. Oh boy, thank you. I'll read this. Wow, look at this, it's a big, it's like a book. <laughs> hey, you, you drew all that, right? Very good, and that's that's the skyline of Seattle. With the wow, great! Thank you. Wow, look at this. Okay, wow. This looks like what we're going to do this afternoon. Very good. Thank you. That's really nice. You what? I accidentally did it backwards. Oh, that's okay. That means you were probably a Muslim in your last life. They do everything backwards. Yeah. Okay, I'll read this. I'll read this. Thank you. Thank you, Arish. Hare Krishna. Jai. Srila Prabhupada. Hare Bhava Prabhuji. Thank you. Jai. All glories to Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Bhava. Jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Happy Krishna consciousness birthday, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. All glories to Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.